And so folks, I'm going to do a little um, introduction of um, Dr. Wehi, um, and then um, let him take it away because it's got lots of cool stuff to say and I'm psyched about it. All right, so um, Dr. Wehi um, joined us at TAMUCC relatively recently. I think I want to say 2019. Yeah, um, but has already made just a huge impact on this campus and on, on our students. Um, that is actually the reason that I reached out to ask him to do a book talk with us was one of our student workers at the library was talking about what a great class um, you were leading. And so we're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, Dr. Wehi's uh, educational background is in English literature. Um, and here on campus, he teaches literature and culture, British literature, 1830 to 1900. Um, and introduction to women gender studies. Um, his research interests, of course, span literature, um, but they also incorporate queer theory, disability studies, um, gender and sexuality studies, um, and they incorporate performance and visual culture as well. Um, recently, I um, really enjoyed watching you speak at Natalia and Segovia's Libre panel, um, where um, you were able to bring in sort of that context from um, some some of your your British literature um, context, which was really it was really interesting. Um, and so, if anyone hasn't attended the Hispanic Heritage Month events, um, shame on you. Uh, we'll we'll get to them next year, and I highly recommend them. They're always interesting. So, anyways, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Wehi and listen to um, a book talk on Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, it's a super cool book. It looks like several of you are already really excited about it um, in the chat. So I'm excited. Um, and Dr. Wehi, I will go ahead and stop sharing um, so you can see your squares of people um, and go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much, Emily. And thank you uh, for the entire uh, Mary and Jeff library, like rockstar team, uh, keeping us going during an ongoing pandemic, creating um, and sustaining really rich virtual events to keep us together and think about um, the power of a good book and a good story, right? And that is something that we definitely need during a pandemic and something that uh, I think you've just been um, so generous and creative in developing uh, and running these book talks. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I also uh, just want to say that, um, yeah, uh, please use this virtual space as your body mind uh, needs to. So um, uh, if at any point uh, during the conversation, if you have a question, please drop it into chat um, and that we can sort of collect, right? If you're like, oh, I'm not gonna remember this for the future. Um, uh, if you feel like comfortable on mic or, or like mic off and camera off, totally fine. Just use this virtual space as, um, as you need, as your body says that you should. Um, so, quick plot summary of Silvia Moreno Garcia's Mexican Gothic um, that uh, I'm also going to try and avoid spoilers as well uh, to not ruin any of the bananagram sort of right plot developments that happen. But uh, I'm very excited to be doing this work uh, during October during spooky season. Um, and uh, this novel tells the story of uh, Noemi uh, Taboada, who has to visit her cousin Catalina, who has fallen sick during her first years of marriage to Victor. Um, and they are living in his spooky colonial home in the Mexican countryside. It is called High Place. Catalina does not have access to like a real doctor or real health care. The assumption is that uh, Catalina needs to be sort of saved from this place, this spooky, crumbling mansion and mine that uh, is literally um, and figuratively built on the labor and lives of indigenous uh, silver miners. So uh, it is a gothic horror story that is trying to think through um, ideas of sort of superiority and inferiority, family status and family legacies uh, that Victor Doyle and his um, uh, patriarchal relation, Howard Doyle, are uh, very, very, very gothically invested in um, uh, the future and through lines and family sort of uh, reproduction. So during the nights, uh, Noemi dreams of uh, mushrooms and spores and a sort of myconoid network that reveals the past trauma of High Place. Um, and it becomes clear that she is in a plot 
uh, that is about sort of marriage reproduction and the violent uh, traumas and pasts uh, in and around this space. So um, super cool book. Everybody should read it. Very excited that there's a giveaway. Um, and I think what I want to offer up in this space today uh, is thinking about the ways that Gothic literature poses problems about reproduction, hetero reproduction, uh, poses problems about sort of population management, what sort of right Michel Foucault calls biopolitics, the idea of uh, shaping sort of bodies and shaping sort of right, um, ooh, uh, the ways that certain lives get reproduced and other lives get foreclosed because of sort of racist histories of eugenic scientific racism. And uh, I'm going to hopefully write, like, spend a lot of time luxuriating in the beautiful prose uh, from Marina Garcia's Mexican Gothic, where she picks up and undercuts some of the particularly um, more nasty and insidious themes from the histories of Gothic horror or horror lit as well. Because um, while this novel is sort of, right, uh, legibly Mexican Gothic, right, it's coming from like a Wuthering Heights, Bronte um, sort of tradition. Marina Garcia herself works in the idiom of sort of eldritch horror, um, most notably coming from, right, like that uh, HP Lovecraft nightmare mythos, um, and Lovecraft is a problem. Um, so what I thought I would do today is first share some thoughts about the OG Gothic novel, Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole from uh, 1764. It's one of the uh, first novels to sort of write, like, tag itself as a gothic tale uh, and think about some of the ways that Walpole creates space to put uh, pressure on some of the structures of patrilineality, primogeniture, this idea of organizing families and lives around reproducing sons who turn into fathers, who have more sons, who are becoming fathers when they make more sons ad infinitum, right? Just like this problem of patriarchy uh, and uh, the ways that property, privilege, and money is passed between men, between fathers and sons uh, to infinity. Uh, so in Castle of Otranto, we see sort of a tyrannical masculinity from a gothic nightmare man, literally named Manfred, uh, and his impulse to sustain his family race through the violence of compulsory heterosexuality. Um, and then after the 18th century and sort of doing this Castle of Otranto um, sort of pit stop, um, I, I want to take a brief detour to 20th century H.P. Lovecraft um, and thinking about uh, how Miranda Garcia is responding to um, Lovecraftian eldritch horror, which is itself really built on deeply racist and ableist worldviews sustained through fictions of medical racism. Um, so Lovecraft, just be clear, let's get this on the table, absolute garbage, nightmare racist person, insane, right? Just bad. Duh. Um, and uh, the horror of uh, his fiction is often tied to fantasies of um, blood and physiognomy, right? That there is somehow something that demarcates different races based on scientific proven blood, and that you can also measure racial difference uh, through sort of physiognomy, the sort of measuring of faces and body structures. And those measurements, those measurements will create a sort of indelible truth of the body, right? So Lovecraft is invested in a 19th, 20th century racist social project of trying to demarcate racial difference based on sort of science, anatomy, proof, and objectivity. And we're going to see how, hopefully, uh, Moreno Garcia um, resists that and sort of undoes that in Mexican Gothic, specifically calling attention to those structures uh, and those fantasies and uh, giving us a very different space for women, especially women of color in Gothic history. Um, so that's the goal. All right, um, in the second edition of Louis Walpole's uh, Castle of Toronto, he adds the subtitle, A Gothic Story, and then he adds uh, in the title page, um, a little Latin. Um, and I'm not gonna read the Latin out loud, one, because I can't, two, because reading Latin out loud is how you summon ghosts, and that's just real. Um, the translation from Horace uh, reads, quote, idle fancies shall be shaped like a sick man's dream so that neither foot nor head can be assigned a single shape. Uh, and uh, this is a really interesting framework in the second edition because it marks Gothic tales, because it marks Gothic fictions as inherently sick, idle fantasies shaped like a sick man's dream that there is something about Gothic fiction that 
invokes and operates in um, some sort of pleasure in physically confusing and confounding the body, that bodies don't look and feel like they should, and that we can operate in a sort of right inherently sick way, but that sick isn't isn't a disqualification. It's not negative, right? Like what if there's something cool about being sick? What if sick lit or sick genres open up different considerations about who gets to be human, about who gets to reproduce, um, about who gets to sort of right live in the world? Um, so, uh, I think that Moreno Garcia is also invoking, uh, this sick lit genre, um, by be uh, beginning with concerns about health, right? Catalina, who has sort of, um, acquired some sort of degeneracy, some sort of illness while living in a high place. There's even sort of questions to, uh, is the type of help that she's getting in this isolated, um, bougie, rich, colonizing space, is that healthcare going to be good? Is it accurate? Is it real? Is it actually providing for her? Um, and what are the ways that maybe we might even have to write, like, remove Catalina and get her um, institutionalized for some sort of help? So there's uh, a very real question, both at the beginning of Castle of Toronto and Mexican Gothic, that marks the Gothic space as a sick space, and that we are talking about questions of care, questions of community, questions of access. So for Walpole, 1764s, uh, Otranto is a site to expose patriarchal violence of organizing family bloodlines around male heirs. Um, shout, anybody, anybody done the Otranto before? Um, feel free to sound off in chat. Um, I start uh, uh, my uh, slasher course, um, as Emily was sort of referencing, uh, with Castle of Otranto uh, to think about sort of patterns of um, horror fictions and patrilineality and patriarchy. Um, so 10 out of 10 would recommend also Castle of the Toronto. Um, that feels real windy. That, um, uh, so there's this idea of patrilineality, right? Securing property and privilege by passing it from father to son to father to son, from father to son, et cetera. Um, and one of those sort of, one of the problems of this in the novel is that it leads Manfred, the Prince of the Toronto, uh, it leads to his downfall and the loss of his kingdom. Everything just comes crumbling around Manfred who is trying to violently consolidate um, family bloodline, his race and property around male heirs. Um, so just the opening lines of uh, the novel um, uh, sort of alert us to, I think, questions of sickness, questions of patrilineality, questions of patriarchal violence. Uh, chapter one opens, quote, Manfred, Prince of Toronto, had one son and one daughter. The latter, a most beautiful virgin, aged 18, was called Matilda. Conrad the son was three years younger, a homely youth, sickly, and of no promising disposition. Yet he was the darling of his father who never showed any symptoms of affection to Matilda. Manfred had contracted a marriage for his son with the Marquis of Vicenza's daughter, Isabella, and she had already been delivered by her guardians into the hands of Manfred that he might celebrate the wedding as soon as Conrad's infirm state of health would permit. Conrad's impatience for the ceremonial was remarked by his family and neighbors. Uh, there's just this sort of um, push, right? The beginning of the novel really doesn't uh, uh, pull punches here where it's like, cool, cool, cool. Manfred desperately wants a son, desperately wants his son to get married to this woman, Isabella, in order to consolidate that bloodline. But the problem is that sickness and chronic illness jeopardize um, Manfred's um, ability to sustain that family line, right? As organized between men uh, and between sort of fathers and sons. So the novel, spoiler alert, in that opening chapter, just straight up kills Conrad. Um, uh, a giant helmet falls on Conrad. Uh, so absolutely um, uh, uh, just crushing Manfred's sort of desires um, to sort of keep that family going via patrilineality. Um, so in order to try and sort of uh, intervene, Manfred decides that he's going to marry his son's promised wife instead. Um, so if you have read Mexican Gothic, you know that these sort of threats of almost incest, borderline incest questions of, right, like marrying a cousin or like your future sister-in-law, right? Like that is all sort of, right, got a real Gothic past uh, that, again, Marina Garcia picks up on. But in this, uh, in this novel, uh, 
he threatens to sort of write, take Isabella for himself. Um, so to take a young woman who was supposed to be in his care as part of, right, like a stopgap before she got passed into sort of, right, like Conrad marriage shows you that precarious place of trafficking women in 18th century Gothic novels, right? That women become uh, dangerously used as tools passed between men in order to secure power and privilege between men and genealogy. And it becomes uh, particularly threatening uh, in the novel um, when Manfred corners Isabella in a gallery in a castle. Um, and the following scene sort of happens in, again, chapter one. There's a lot packed in. It's five chapters, but super compressed. It's a wild ride. Um, Manfred, uh, it was now evening. So this is a, a block quote from Walpole. It was now evening. The servant who conducted Isabella bore a torch before her. When they came to Manfred, who was walking impatiently about the gallery, he started and said hastily, take away that light and be gone. Then shutting the door impetuously, he flung himself on a bench against the wall and bade Isabella sit by him. She obeyed, trembling. I sent for you, lady, said he, and then stopped under great appearance of confusion. My lord? Yes, I sent for you on a matter of great moment, resumed he. Dry your tears, young lady. You have lost your bridegroom. Yes, cruel fate, and I have lost the hopes of my race. But Conrad was not worthy of your beauty. How, my lord, said Isabella, sure you do not suspect me of not feeling the concern I ought. My duty and affection would have always think no more of him, interrupted Manfred. He is a sickly, puny child, and heaven has perhaps taken him away that I might not trust the honors of my house on so frail a foundation. The line of Manfred calls for numerous supports. My foolish fondness for that boy blinded the eyes of my prudence, but it is better as it is. I had hoped in a few years to have reason to rejoice at the death of Conrad. Um, and this right line is particularly horrifying um, because I think there are several like nightmare garbage ideologies that sort of consolidate in this moment. Um, that again, Mexican Gothic is sort of attentive to in this 18th century historical moment. That one, right, compulsory heterosexuality, this idea from Adrian Rich that uh, the institutionalized uh, treatment of women under heteronormative structures like marriage works to secure men's unquestioned access to women's bodies, right? So like the first nightmare thing is just Manfred thinking, oh yeah, cool, cool, cool. Here's a woman in an enclosed private space. I can have access to her garbage, right? Uh, part two, uh, I think um, what this opens up is a way of thinking about disability that says that chronically ill or sick bodies are not able to literally support. They are not the pillars um, of uh, of uh, reproduction, they are not, they should not be reproduced as livable lives. And for Manfred, right, calling attention to his house on so frail a foundation that it comes to sort of, right, uh, solidify what we might identify as ableism, right? That idea that uh, disability makes somebody inherently less than, makes, uh, creates justifications for sort of discrimination. And then I think this image of lines, the line of Manfred, uh, becomes a really important way to think about how um, Marina Garcia complicates it because what Manfred's imagining is like one future line, the house of Otranto of Manfred, and then what Mexican Gothic opens up is actually like networks of violence, like what if these types of structures of patterns are both linear, but also cyclical and sort of right mushroom like in their outgrowths. Um, so I think uh, uh, Mexican Gothic offers us a more critical investment in sort of intersectionality or a more critical investment in resisting of uh, being aware that multiple violences come from multiple places at multiple times um, that uh, uh, builds on this sort of right like uh, violence of patrilineality. So Isabella gets away in the novel um, with the help of a ghost stepping out of a, a frame. Um, and uh, the ghost is of Manfred's grandfather and apparently like comes out of the uh, portrait and it's like, hey, this is bad. Um, also it's sexual assault, shut it down. Um, and so like, there's something uh, again, if and you have not read Mexican Gothic, something interesting about who's doing the hauntings. So in Mexican Gothic, um, very, we come to learn that um, Naomi is being haunted by 
um, uh, former wives um, of the patriarch in the house. And so, whereas in uh, OG Gothic tale, Castle of Toronto, it's sort of men haunting other men. What Marina Garcia opens up is actually what if we can think about networks of women's resistances across histories to do some sort of cross-generational allegiances um, in thinking about the violence in the home. Um, but also I think it's cool haunted ancestors popping up in both of these spaces where, right, like where it feels like the novel's really attentive to the 18th century sort of prehistories. Okay, so um, uh, Castle of Toronto is wild. That's sort of where I'm coming from in terms of Gothic histories. That is sort of right the way that I see uh, Mexican Gothic um, uh, doing similar work of critiquing sort of right arbitrary power, Gothic spaces, haunted sort of mansions, um, and sort of right uh, sort of the long history of um, fears of sexual violence and the ways that reproduction or the ways that certain versions of reproduction in terms of investments in white supremacy, investments in economic security, uh, do that violent history of sustaining one's race. So for Manfred and for Walpole, like um, when Manfred is like, uh, I've lost the hopes of my race, it's not necessarily about like British white imperial masculinity, but it's not not, not about that, right? Uh, that uh, it has its sort of, um, uh, it has its sort of investments in sustaining sort of right uh, what H.P. Lovecraft will pick up for as like just deeply racist fantasies about white blood and sort of the meaning of blood and the meaning of bodies. So for Lovecraft, pit stop in the 20th century, uh, fantasies of race and the truth about the body get weaponized to create exclusionary, discriminatory, and violent ways of thinking. Um, the horror in like the Lovecraftian uh, universe um, threatens to undo or sort of right um, tear apart sort of pure whiteness. And as an example, I just want to uh, share uh, two garbage moments from uh, a 1930s tale, uh, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which is sort of set in a weird Massachusetts like horror space, um, which appeals to me because I did my degree in New England. And so like that, what if Massachusetts is always a nightmare garbage hell place? Um, but uh, the narrator in The Shadow Over Innsmouth um, finds himself in an abandoned fishing town with degenerating humanoids who have their sort of DNA or their genetics corrupted by reproducing like old god fish monsters. It's wild. Um, so the impulse of the story is to do this sort of pseudoscientific work of creating classifications and performing sort of paraclinical observations. Uh, the novella begins uh, as the narrator state quotes, I never heard of Innsmouth until the day that I saw it for the first and so far last time. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham where my mother's family was derived. So that in conflating the pleasure of a tour with a pleasure for sort of classifying, right, antiques, sightseeing, and genealogies, histories of people and bodies and reproduction, Lovecraft sets up the gaze of the narrator as producing sort of truth-making uh, uh, truth making organizational tools, right? If I can mark out visually the difference between different species of people, I'm investigating or I'm uh, invested in creating sort of principles of organization, hierarchy, classification that is invested in sort of 19th century uh, concerns and 20th century concerns about uh, maintaining racial divisions and doing that through sort of right, like their version of scientific sort of resources. Um, a lot of that is coming through the racialized language about disease and sort of blood. Um, the narrator informs that the current state of Innsmouth, quote, that was before the big epidemic of 1846 when over half the folks in Innsmouth were carried off. They never did quite figure what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. Um, that uh, I think what we see is the sort of uh, long history of um, conflating sort of disease, infection, and foreignness, uh, the ways that sort of, right, like anti-Asian rhetoric still gets picked up in 2021 to think about sort of epidemics in China, the ways that horror fiction has long been invested in, at least this Lovecraft model, um, utilizing disease, body, and racial difference in order to sort of very create a fear of foreign bodies. Um, 
uh, that Lovecraft sort of right thinks about the way that this place in Innsmouth, uh, which right like uh, is sort of infected by quote queer ports in Africa, Asia, the South Seas, and elsewhere, and what queer kinds of people they sometimes brought back with them. So he's using queer in like the odd sort of sense, but it is about sort of Lovecraft's fantasies or Lovecraft's sort of right like racist fantasies about um, keeping bloodlines pure, clean, uh, American, and that we see this sort of xenophobic racist work continue throughout this short story. Um, uh, and it also gets sort of reproduced on the bodies of the like fish folk in Innsmouth that um, uh, the way that they are described in the story, some of them have quote, queer narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy starry eyes that never seem to shut and their skin ate quite right, rough and scabby the sides of their necks are. So it's about fishness, but like also because of racist histories and plottings, uh, the uh, staking out of appropriate nose shape, the staking out of appropriate or sort of inappropriate eye shape, other sort of facial features are tied to sort of 19 projects of physiognomy, measuring and delineating features in order to see if one could come up with patterns and meanings and like truths of bodies. And of course, right, like for our current 2020, like we understand that this is not real scientific practice, but this was weaponizing scientific practice in the 19th and 20th century in order to authorize and create truths about race and truths about ways to evaluate a body. So this is the garbage history, right? Moving on, this is the bad part, right? Uh, since Walpole, we've been thinking about these sort of histories of lineages. We've been thinking about how patrilineality uh, and patriarchal systems create sort of jeopardies and vulnerabilities for women, white British women, but women, right? And then Lovecraft gives us a glimpse into how these lines and systems and fears uh, work to disqualify people of color and how the body must bear a sort of meaning of truth. So Sylvia Marina Garcia stakes out a different space than to reflect on and critique these histories through uh, Noemi's encounters in High Place. And I wanna, I wanna read some of that. Does that feel real? How do we feel about this prehistory? We can just say garbage, right? It garbage, it garbage. Uh, I feel like Sharuk would, um, hi Sharuk, uh, could attest to a garbage um, uh, that certainly uh, the literary prehistories feel particularly invested in certain forms of violence and disqualification. And so recognizing that that's the idiom that maybe Marina Garcia is sort of right gesturing to. I love like the different opportunities that she can create um, here in Mexican Gothic. So I thought I would read um, a, a few moments from the beginning and the end, not spoilery, uh, that sort of invoke that history to call attention to it and offer a sort of a different uh, space. So I'm on 29 and man, I'm a bad person as I did not put these block quotations in any sort of uh, read along format. So I apologize for that. Um, we'll just pretend it's like ASMR, that um, upon entrance, she meets uh, the Howard Doyle, the sort of patriarch of high space, um, and uh, they're introduced. And he says, and I am Howard Doyle, Doyle, Virgil's father, although you've guessed that already. The old man wore an old fashioned cravat, his neck hidden under a mound of fabric, a circular silver pin upon it as decoration, a large amber ring on his index finger, he fixed his eyes on her. The rest of him was bleached of color, but the eyes were of a startling blue, unimpeded by cataracts and undimmed by age. The eyes burned coldly in that ancient face and commanded her attention, vivisecting the young woman with his gaze. You are much darker than your cousin, uh, Miss Taboada, um, Howard said after he had completed his examination of her. Pardon me? She asked, thinking she'd heard him wrong. He pointed at her. Both your coloration and your hair, they are much darker than Catalina's. I imagine they reflect your Indian heritage rather than the French. You do have some Indian in you know, like those of the mestizos here do. Merely an observation. Now tell me, Ms. Tabarada, do you believe, as Mr. Vasconcelos does, that uh, uh, it is the obligation, no, the destiny of the people of Mexico to forge a new race that encompasses all races, a cosmic race, a bronze mace, that despite the research of Davenport and uh, Stagerda, and this sort of contention, this sort of conversation continues about knowledge production, about racial phenotypes and categories, right? 
that one of the things that Marina Garcia offers us here um, is a really condemning uh, moment of looking, right? That the gaze is sort of, right, creating a clinical, violent patriarchal gaze. That patriarchy is also tied to sort of, right, um, white supremacy, and that is tied to medical practice, the dissecting and inciting published research about the sort of truth for race and the truth of a body. And to front load that within the first couple of chapters of Mexican Gothic allows Marina Garcia to um, signpost the bad Lovecraft stuffs she is inheriting and then offer up sort of different spaces where throughout the novel continually pressing on um, aesthetics, continuing pressing on uh, this type of violence uh, and ultimately wondering about ways out and ways sort of forward. Um, uh, the questions of reproduction um, seem to continue as you Noemi, know, uh, uh, as Virgil, uh, Catalina's husband, also nightmare patriarch man, uh, reveals some about the house history. Um, and questions of um, uh, uh, the violence of what it takes to sustain a family house, a race, a lineage. Um, it's quite a lovely house once it gets to know you, Virgil says, a um, little later in 238. Now, I guess the question is whether you are determined to be a nuisance or whether you're willingly join the family. On the walls, the three deer heads cast long shadows. You have an interesting notion of willingly, Noemi said. Are you offering any other option to me? I don't think so. I decided to stay alive, if that's what you would like to know. I don't want to end up in a pit like those poor miners. We didn't dump them in a pit. They're all buried in the cemetery, and they needed to die. You must make the soil fertile. With human bodies, mulch. Isn't that right? So this question of sustainability, right? This image of nature, of trees, of growth, of seemingly borrowing again from 18th century sort of fiction, natural sort of reproduction must be sustained by violence, must be sustained by like deep inequities, um, right? That literally built on the bodies of indigenous laborers. Um, so the ways that Moreno Garcia is able to stake out uh, a sort of right, like intersectionally attentive critique of the very real violences that it takes to sort of right create white supremacist sustainable fictions um, is something that I think is very much at the heart of Mexican Gothic. Um, and it is, she is sort of right, troubling uh, uh, these types of um, Gothic and El Trator prehistories in really productive ways. And everybody should absolutely read this book. And I can't say more because I really like the exit. Uh, and like the ending of it um, that you should all read and think about uh, if the problem that uh, Moreno Garcia is inheriting are these types of sort of right discriminatory exclusionary fictions. Um, I, uh, the ending provides certainly one way out uh, and certainly one way to sort of um, handle those sort of right artifacts. And that's what I will say. I hope we have time for a uh, discussion and a raffle and a giveaway. So I want to stop talking now because I've said all the words. Well, and you said such great words and in such a good order. So like 10 out of 10. Um, <laughs> I am going to go ahead and while I've got this copied, um, I have just dropped a link into the chat for anyone who wants to access um, the, we do have a physical copy of Mexican Gothic at the library. It is currently checked out though, because it's such a great book. Um, so I've dropped a link. There is um, an ebook as well. If someone, um, you know, wants to read it right now, which you should. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly um, so we can make sure to get these raffle prizes out to folks. Um, and then we'll take um, the rest of the time for uh, questions. Okay, so sharing this. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and spin my wheel of names. Is actually called Wheel of Names if anyone wants to use it. Kelly Smith! Kelly, are you still here? I think she is. Yay! Awesome. Okay. Um, Fantastic. 
wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and spin it one more time because we have two whole copies of this gray book. And like, I kind of want Wendy Walker to win. I'm not going to lie. I think that'd be really fun. I mean, the oh, oh, man. I was reading for Shrewd. Okay. It, it goes to Joanna, who, um, Joanna is still here. Awesome. Okay. So, um, because you are both folks who I know are periodically on campus, um, I'm going to leave copies of this book at our circulation desk for you. I will put a lovely sticky note with your name on it. Um, and you can swing by and pick that up. Um, go ahead and stop sharing now. And awesome. Oh, I love when it works out and both folks are here. So, um, oh, don't come right now, Kelly. I'm in my office and so are the books. So like, yeah. <laughs> I am, I am sticking around for this because I'm That's curious about are, how yeah. the talk's going to go. So, but yes, I will put these out at the circulation desk at three o'clock. Um, oh, that's awesome. Okay, so um, does anyone have questions for Dr. Wehi? Um I do, if no one else does. I Nothing came up in the chat, but I assume it's because we were all just like super into this talk. Um, so let's see, anyone, you're welcome to unmute if you are comfortable speaking. If you'd rather go and put a question in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, See, while folks are taking their time, maybe typing or thinking of how to beautifully word their questions, um, my first question for you, Dr. Wei, he is, um, when I first um, approached you about doing a book talk, you said your, your history was in, you know, white British guys, um, and you said you didn't want to talk about them, and so that's, that's what brought you to land on Mexican Gothic. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why it was important to maybe talk about Mexican Gothic or maybe just focus on an author or a story that didn't center those British white guys. I mean, yeah, I think, um, this, this is the problem that my talk actually reproduced, which is, I think it's, um, bananagrams garbage to want to say like horror is invented in this idiom with these white dudes with these investments. Now let's turn to something different, right? That creates a lineage and trajectory. And when I talked at that, um, but I think, um, in a different, but I think what uh, is so exciting to take uh, these very specific references that Marina Garcia is making in her novel um, and sort of write, sit with her, luxuriate in that sort of right moment and have just like, have her get to sort of say like, no, those histories, I'm going to take them and turn them into like the violent antagonists of this novel in ways that create deeply exclusionary, jeopardizing nightmare hellscapes, right? And high place and in this manner um, is something that is so, I think it's valuable. I think it's refreshing, um, but I also think it, um, it equips readers who maybe come to Mexican Gothic with certain assumptions about what Gothic fiction needs to be, right? Wuthering Heights, Jane Eyre, et cetera, and what eldritch horror needs to be. Um, and it says, no, those histories don't, those histories are invested in particular mechanics that create very particular problems for women of color. That is not what this story is. So the horror can be, the horror can be weaponized in a different way to call attention to the exclusionary practices rather than the horror being the exclusionary practice that I think that, um, uh, that creates space for her to uh, create uh, it for uh, create space for critique, right? Yeah. And I wish I wish we could all come to the table having read uh, because I really uh, the novel is beautifully plotted. I think it's very important for thinking about um, sustainability and disability, right? And the care for bodies and others. Um, and I think. Uh, the governing conceit of like mold, mushroom spores, networks uh, becomes just a really invaluable way to see, to think more intricately about connections and oppressions um, across bodies. Um, so you, you sort of alluded to like care and health and medicine and before um folks joined us, you and I were talking about how it felt to read this book during a pandemic. Um, 
do you want to talk maybe a little about um, what it felt like to read this book during a pandemic or um, maybe how it impacted your reading experience? I mean, absolutely, right? That um, uh, several of the conceits of Gothic fiction are that your heroine has to be isolated, put away, right? Uh, endangered without sort of easy ways in or out. Um, and that also uh, what the, so like that just felt particularly hard during lockdown of just like, oh, right, actually we all can't see anybody, but also it's for our public good and for our own, like, and for the good of others. So like, that's an interesting sort of form of attachment uh, that can't be actualized, right? Like our attachment has to be disattachment. Um, but uh, I think what Catalina, I like Catal I really like uh, the images of Catalina as sort of chronically ill woman who is invested in like a literary history and literary past, but is sort of made highly vulnerable by different types of inequities. Um, and that uh, the original doctor who sort of comes to see her is um, uh, paid by the Doyles, right? And uh, is the doctor that looks most legitimate um, under sort of right white ethnocentric um, uh, models of the clinic of the body of wholeness and wellness. Um, so it was interesting to see where Marina Garcia is staking out um, alternative ways of knowing that don't have to come from that version of the clinic always, uh, which I thought was interesting in national conversations about public health, wellness, um, and which bodies are mattering. Ooh, yeah, I think I think Guillermo del Toro is absolutely um, so important. Yeah, actually, the the new talk that I want to write, uh, or the new talk that I want to hear you give, Shirk, is um, thinking about Guillermo del Toro, Mexican horror, um, and the difference between like Shape of Water and Mexican Gothic put together. Because I think it again, right, like. If horror is in the hands of historically like cishet white dudes invested in colonialism and certain white supremacist practices, the horror feels and looks like it might be historically weaponized against people of color, queer folks, gender variant folks, et cetera, right? But for Guillermo del Toro and for Moreno Garcia, what we are offering is what if the horror is about speaking back against those violences and showing different ways of intimacies, different ways of connections that have historically been monstrous, but are actually sort of really important, cool alternate networks, right? That, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, Shape of Water is sort of in my mind, but uh, definitely I think um, uh, what Mexican Gothic offers is a way of seeing the violence in heteronormative white supremacist colonial relationships, right? That like the thing that Marina Garcia points to is that certain heteronorm heteronormative structures organized by like white imperial desire um, is violent and bad. Uh, and also Shape of Water gets us out of thinking about um, the value of bodies, the value of deaf bodies. Um, and different sort of forms of intimacy. That's what I'll say. Do you have thoughts about Guillermo del Toro? Everybody go watch Shape of Water again. Just live in that world too. That's a lovely movie. Um, so this makes me think of another question, which is sort of related, but sort of more of just me um, wanting to like get everything I can when you know we have you mm -hmm. contained here in a square, um, and talking about horror and talking about yeah. you know um, maybe not quite horror, but like weird vibes for lack of a better mm -hmm. phrase, like weird fiction, um, the uncanny. Yeah. Um, have you read anything where that actually like scared you or gave you that vibe and you're like nope don't read that one at midnight gotta have the lights on i'm, I'm curious if, if for me this book didn't do that because i was so oh, yeah. into it and i was just mm -hmm. like loving i was like actively enjoying it and thinking about yeah. it um have you have you come across a book that you 
of maybe in the horror genre or the weird genre that you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you you know it, it it impacts you it it puts those vibes into you not recently um uh i also it's also very rare for me to read outside of my uh research um or like the current design books so like that's a problem that i have um but i agree that this is not this is the thing that i think uh contemporary gothic film and contemporary gothic based on mexican gothic sort of offers us is like the reminder that the gothic tradition is a love story right like it is in Debted to particular um, uh, formulas from the romance uh, in the uh, late 18th, 19th century and romantic sort of literatures and plottings. Um, uh, and so what I found myself less scared here, but certainly just like, oh, man, that's a lot of violence going on. Uh, but then looking for those sort of opportunities, the ways that um, desire, equity and relationships and intimacies could be felt different in this novel. Um, so I haven't been horrified by a novel in a good long time. Looking forward to any suggestions to make me feel that way, though. Anyone has uh, recommendations yeah. to scare Dr. Wayhe, please. Yeah. <laughs> please do. Um, <laughs> um, I I have many more questions, but I feel I if anyone wants to, to unmute, I'm going to stop talking for a hot second, just so if anyone wants to jump in, here's your chance. Please do. I'm just gonna keep talking then, Dr. Wehi. Um, here we go. Um, one but of the- TV, if we should say that, right? Haunting a Blind Mariner absolutely needs to be on the table. Uh, Mike uh, Flanagan's latest Midnight Mass, put that on the table. Awesome. For long form horror TV. Okay. Wait, what was the first one? I lost it. Oh, Haunting of Bly Manor, which is done, I will say, when I read it first as an undergrad, I was, like, legit terrified of Turn of the Screw, right, the Henry James uh, novel. So, yeah, like, that's fair. Just gave me, like, real uncanny vibes when I read it for the first time. Uh, and then to have that beautifully adapted for, like, long-form TV was, um, was a treat for me. I had the same thing with um, The Haunting of Hill House, the book. I haven't seen the show because I can't, I'm too scared. I, mm-mm. -mm. It's intense. It is beautiful. It is also a love story, but it is got some brutal visuals. Loved it. 10 out of 10. So, thinking of gothic stories as love stories is for me kind of a new perspective. I just don't mm -hmm. think of that as being the main part, but applying that to Mexican gothic is really interesting to me because the story there is the cousins kind of are the yes. ones who love each other and save each other, like, try to save each other and that's really interesting. And that to me sort of addresses that like marriage and mm -hmm. also like value and like, I have so much to think about now. <laughs> I mean, what I love about, right? Like, sure. I think Marina Garcia peppers in right potential love interests. Um, uh, and we're like, okay, well, if it's not Victor, who's kind of sexy, but kind of dark, kind of whatever, absolutely nightmare man. Um, or like Francis, who's like not like other family members, right? Like um, she she laces in all of these sort of right potentials and then ultimately collapses that family, the Doyles, into just like straight up violence and right cycles of violence patterns that like the violence moves again in just different trajectories. But like family, kinship, man, like oh, for your cousin, that's something interesting that breaks us out of sort of heteronormative traditions that opens up just more sort of structures of feeling in the novel that I, I think are really valuable to keep in mind, right? That like plotting doesn't always have to have a heteroerotic drive. Oh, Wendy says she's going to have more questions when she's read the book. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Boy, yeah. Will ya. yeah, my email address <laughs> will hang out. Absolutely. Um, um, there is a component to this book that I, that, that surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, where I don't, I'm confident it's not giving away spoilers to say, um, our, our main character um, experiences some things that make us wonder if she's really experiencing them mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. is she dreaming? Yeah. Has she been slipped something? Um, Which again, so... nightmare, right? Like again, Gothic isolating spaces creates vulnerabilities for women historically forever, yes. 
so my question for you no that's that's absolutely where this come from yeah wendy it's it is there's a jane Eyre vibe mm -hmm. and um uh what do you think was happening to her dr way was she was this happening was she dreaming was she drugged what what was going on do you think yeah so noemi is i like it's mm, the story is mostly sort of right like third person limited we're really sort of in her brain um the thing that is interesting here is it's invoking like a long history of right like women in precarious positions in gothic mansions uh based on sort of right like what they should or should not consume right thinking about again just like oh should i have a glass of wine should i not what are the ways that this thing opens me up to other sort of um, vulnerabilities and dangers? And um, so very much Marina Garcia has that at the foreground on the table. Um, and this is where I think Marina Garcia reveals her like investment in like eldritch horror rather than gothic fiction is like it does the genre blending of just like old elder god spooky thing that is unexplainable and um, uh, borderline sci-fi, right? Um, uh, and this is, I think that's, I think that trope or that sort of um, plot device is also what garners um, attention of this novel from Victor Lavelle, uh, who is doing like a lot of really smart um, anti-Lovecraftian or non-Lovecraftian sort of horror that sort of says like, no, actually, cool, 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 that's garbage. Please, let's just have this elder horror in the hands of people of color. Um, and so like Victor Lavelle, loves this novel and i think it's because of this sort of right like uh unexplainable uncanny um mind meld thing that uh um that our gothic heroine experiences here and it's spooky but also raises like long histories of questions of like believability and narration gaslighting hysterical women right all of these sort of right concerns yeah, it did make me think of some of the scenes made me think of that the yellow wallpaper story where it's like, oh, I mean, and so much of it is wallpapery right here where like, she's thinking about the sport network and the like patterns on the walls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Um... Uh, give her a Netflix show. How do we petition to have um, Marina Garcia get a Netflix show? Like, it's got to be in the works. Right. It, it must be. Oh, that is a question I have for you. Um, were you, did you ever watch the, um, uh, it was, well, it was called Lovecraft Count Lovecraft Country. Country. Yeah, I find that Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country is such a oh, hard text to talk about, um, both because the source material is like OG white guy just trying to be progressive, but like that original like novel is not doing the thing it needs to. So to adapt it for film, even with like um, the most conscientious directors um, and writers at the table, the cinematography reproduced that sort of Lovecraftian white clinical gaze and that sort of Howard Doyle um, vivisecting gaze. Like it does the same thing, thank you Rita, um, uh, that it, that on the level of film form, uh, the camera only oriented us to violence against Black lives in ways that, like, forced us to do that vivisecting work, that it didn't force us to sort of, right, come up, that on the whole, especially about violence, it did not sort of imagine alternatives to white gazes on film. So, like, it's a fail for me. I'm not mad that it did not get renewed for season two. And it created a lot of weird potentially regressive work. That's really, that, I'm kind of glad to hear that some of the reviews I saw of it, because when I saw like a preview, I was like, oh, hell yeah, like, let's mess with this story. Um, and then the reviews Which... I saw were similar of sort of like, we live with violence against black bodies. Why are, why is it our entertainment to, mm -hmm. does it's it do that work like... we were hoping it would? Yeah, it can't redirect on the level of form and content and source material, like it doesn't quite do that redirection in ways that uh, I actually think Mexican Gothic does uh, and does it in, um, again, just a much more intimate, slow, um, sensitive way.
Yeah, I, I appreciate how you, I'm glad you pulled out the, the quote you did the first one about vivisecting and um, because I, that, I don't think that caught, I, don't, I didn't catch the nuance of it when I was reading it. I was like, oh, that's creepy, but I didn't know why. And so when you, you highlight like, what is medicine doing here? And what does our, that fake sort of like um, eugenics thing that's happening? Like I read that right. and I was like, that's creepy. Don't talk about her skin. Um, but the vivisecting, like the words are so carefully mm -hmm. chosen to call back to this real icky history. Yeah. Um, without you know i didn't have to know all that history i could still read it and yeah. be like ew what right yeah. nobody needs to read more lovecraft in their lives so sorry for reading it for you um <laughs> but, uh, uh absolutely that it's like no i i see that thing i'm going to note that thing but i'm not going to reproduce that thing here and instead we're going to work to create a different sort of relationship with our doyle and that type of medical racist gaze i have not Um, Wendy, um, have you, have you seen it? Does it like, can, what, what, what's the connection? Um, uh, cause obviously all of us here are excited about, you know, Mexican Catholic and these topics. So, um, I, I think, I think the, what's connecting to me and I haven't watched the entire series because I find it actually really difficult to watch. Um, but the, the depictions of violence against black bodies, again, is I, I I find the de depiction grotesque. Not I mean, in addition to what's actually happening on the screen, right? So, um, I I don't know. I just that that link kind of came to mind when you were talking about Love Cow Country. That's all, though. Really, I need to I need to watch the rest of it as well. It is horror and violence, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I think the thing that Mexican Gothic does so well is how do you, right, Roger Lord, you're never gonna dismantle the master's house with the mantle's tool, master's tools, right? Like that, like that, the way that you, the way that you try and think through a problem might also reproduce that problem, right? So that if your filmic language, if the filmic structures and patterns, right, on the level of just like, how do we shoot how do we light? How do we script sort of right violence against certain bodies and not others and violence against certain lives and not others that like that filmic those tools won't get you to do that thing because the tools are inherently bad, right? The tools are inherently invested in certain types of uh, racism's histories, colonial violences, the dissections, right? Mexican gothics is like, I understand the tools, but I'm going to create um, not just sort of write like take Jane Eyre and set it in Mexico, right? Which would be like the really reductive version of this novel. Um, but let's think through different histories and sort of write note them, but not use those same tools uh, to like try and do world building to try and do sort of write like plotting a novel. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's the thing that I want to say that um, different forms and different narrative devices offer the same offer something different than trying to reproduce former forms in like new trendy diverse settings right that like something structurally has to happen at the novel um and mexican gothic does it for me all right we are um a few minutes over thank you for um taking some extra time with us um dr way I have gotten so much out of this. I feel like this really enriched sort of my experience with the book. Um, I, I don't get to think like an English major very much anymore and I miss it. So this has been really fun. Um, Absolutely. And thank you again for having me. And um, thank you everyone for hanging out during midterms, which are due in 10, no, less than 10 days. They're going to go great. I have oh, yeah. confidence in all of you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm going oh, to go sorry, ahead. It's good to and... see you, but yeah. Awesome. Sorry. Okay.